Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, the 28th of September, and I'm coming to you today to talk about a topic called Patterns of Nation States and Culture in the Atlantic World. And it's going to look at the Enlightenment just a little bit. It's going to look at the American Revolution, and it's going to look at the French Revolution as well. So let's start with the Enlightenment. Um, it's really hard to actually pinpoint a specific date on when the Enlightenment happens. Um, generally speaking, though, 1687 to 1715, that is the beginning. In 1687, that's when Isaac Newton published his Principia Mathematica. 1715, that's the death of the absolute monarch Louis XIV in France. So somewhere between those two dates, that's the general beginning of the Enlightenment. The main principles of the Enlightenment, they can really be simplified to self-evident ideals. Uh, life, liberty, equality, social contracts, uh, representation, constitutionalism. Uh, these beliefs are going to be used to attempt to change and reform the world of the 1700s. And these beliefs, they challenge the social systems of the day and the political systems of the day in Europe and eventually the Americas also. And there's the cover of the Principia Mathematica, and then down below, that is Louis XIV. Uh, there are some important people I think you should know. Um, I'm not going to make you know everybody that lived during the Enlightenment, but these are the ones that I think are important. You got Denis Diderot, and he's the creator of the Encyclopedia, the Rational Dictionary of the Sciences, Arts, and the crafts, better known today simply as the encyclopedia. This was written in 1751, and it was a 17 volume publication that attempted to teach people how to think critically and attempted to get people to think objectively. And Diderot, he praises the science, he praises the industrial arts, he questions religion, he questions faith, and then he openly criticizes social and political institutions. So his goal is to get you to think critically and consider right from wrong, consider science and industry, consider the social structure around you and the political structure around you. We also have a guy named Montesquieu, and he wrote in the year 1748 a book called Spirit of the Laws. And Montesquieu, he is going to advocate the examination of various constitutional forms. In many ways, Montesquieu is the modern parent of constitution. He's going to advocate in the spirit of the laws for a system of checks and balances, a system of the separation of powers, and both of those concepts make their way into the American government, and we have them today. Very closely aligned with Montesquieu is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He wrote The Social Contract in 1762. And in The Social Contract, he asserted the moral and legal equality of man. Um, all men are equal, both in morality and legality. Uh, he also says that the people are sovereign, the people make their own decisions. And he talked about the authority of the general will, the, the general wants and needs of the people. Now he goes even further than that, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he argues that people had lost their natural state of freedom and their natural state of equality to government authorities. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he had a problem with government having too much power. The idea that all men are created equal makes its way into the American Constitution as well. The fourth person that I want you to know for this section is a guy named Adam Smith who wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Adam Smith is extremely important to our world today because he is the inventor of what we know today as capitalism. If you remember, with mercantilism, the economic pie was only so big 
your wealth would never grow in size. You could only take more wealth from somebody else. Well, Adam Smith is going to completely challenge that. He challenges the idea of the scarcity of goods. He challenges the idea of scarcity of resources. And he openly challenges the idea of mercantilism. And mercantilism had been the economic system for hundreds of years at this point. Adam Smith goes even further than that. He actually claims that self-interest alone will drive the economy forward. That the drive and the want to be wealthy, the drive and the want to be successful, the drive and the want to improve yourself will encourage the economy to move forward. And that's where the idea of capitalism comes from today. This idea that self-interest will cause expanding resources and an ever-growing economy. Now here are three more people you should know, but they're known for different reasons. They're what are called enlightened despots. Technically, all three of these people I'm going to talk about are absolute monarchs, but they're absolute monarchs who are willing and voluntarily allow in some of the enlightenment ideals that I just mentioned. Uh, the first of the three is named Frederick the Great. He was the king of Prussia. He used the enlightenment ideals to improve agriculture and improve business methods. And he also changed and simplified the Prussian legal system and made the laws more simple. He also tried to improve the conditions of his peasants. He didn't make them completely equal, but he brought them closer to being equal. You've got Joseph II of Austria and his mom, Maria Theresa. Uh, they ruled together for a short period of time. Um, Maria Theresa, not necessarily one of these enlightened despots, but Joseph II of Austria definitely was. Uh, they reformed the tax system in Austria. They created new laws and a new judicial system that protected peasants in the lower class. And then Joseph II is going to completely get rid of serfdom and completely get rid of the idea of peasants completely. Joseph II and his mom, Maria Theresa, they established freedom of the press, freedom of the religion, and also some literacy programs within Austria. Now, ultimately, Joseph II, his changes do fail, but he is an important step in the direction of the Enlightenment. The last of the three Enlightened despots that I want you to know is Catherine the Great of Russia. And Catherine did what the others tried to do. She simplified the legal system. She improved the conditions for some people. She brought education into Russia. But in Russia, Catherine the Great only increased education and literacy opportunities for the upper class. In Russia, the changes that revolve around the Enlightenment don't make it all the way down to the lower class. All right, the American Revolution. It's a big part of this Enlightenment period. Uh, if you've had U.S. history, you know all about this. So I'm just going to go kind of short here. Uh, you can go all the way back to the 1750s and you have the Seven Years War. It's won by Britain, but it gets the American colonies into trouble. Uh, there's a peace treaty in 1763 called the Peace of Paris. And in the Peace of Paris 1763, the British government gains control from France, all the land east of the Mississippi River. At the same time that's happening, there's rapid population growth and rapid economic growth in the American colonies, and there's this strong pressure to expand beyond the Appalachian Mountains. But after the Seven Years' War is over, the British government passes something known as the Proclamation of 1763. And the Proclamation of 1763 is going to reserve all the land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River for Native Americans. Two reasons for this. Number one, it was to keep the 
trouble down between Native Americans and British colonists. But secondly, it was keep down the costs of maintaining the colonies. If the British colonists had occupied the lands west of the Appalachians, it would have increased the cost on the British government because the British government would have had to uh, provide troops and administration for both the settlers and the Native Americans. Now, to pay for the Seven Years' War, taxes were put on the American colonists to help them pay the war costs and to pay for the upkeep of troops in the colonies. However, the American colonists, they didn't like the Proclamation of 1763. They didn't like being kept out of the land past the Appalachians, and they definitely did not like the taxes that Britain put on them. So we end up with protests against Britain between 1763 and the beginning of the 1770s. Um, shopkeepers, merchants, and printers, they organized the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty. Um, there's a general boycott against British goods after the Stamp Act is passed. And the Stamp Act, by the way, it was a stamp that had to be built on any paperwork to prove that you paid the special paperwork tax, basically. And these protests, they get so big and this boycott gets so big that the Stamp Act is repealed in the year 1766. But then it's very quickly replaced by other taxes such as the Townsend Act or the Tea Act. When we get to 1770, the Boston Massacre occurs colonists are angry at off-duty British soldiers who they think are taking their jobs. A riot breaks out. Some of the colonists in Boston die, and that becomes a huge big thing. Before you know it, Sam Adams and John Adams are putting together a group called the Committees of Correspondence, where they're going to gather thoughts and feelings on the king and on the crown. And then from there, um, we go all the way to open rebellion. And this open rebellion is known as the American Revolution. And the American Revolution, it begins really in 1775. It doesn't start in 1776 like we think. It really begins in 1775. Um, in 1775, the British Army and some American militia fight in the places called Lexington, Concord, and Boston. Eventually, the problem gets bigger and bigger and bigger until a Continental Congress meets in Philadelphia in May of 1776. And in May of 1776, the people who attend the meeting they want to try and bring peace between the British government and the American colonists, but they also realize that may not happen. So they prepare for war at the same time they're preparing for peace. Ultimately, the members of the Continental Congress, they put together what's known today as the Olive Branch Petition. It's a list of grievances and an explanation meant for King George III explaining why the American colonists were resisting and what could be done to improve the situation. King George III reads this petition and he orders the government to treat the colonists as open and avowed enemies. So the the peace offering didn't go so well. And the Continental Congress knew that was a possibility. So at the same time that they sent that petition to Britain and they were waiting for an answer, they had already authorized the raising of a military. They had already authorized the, the um, printing of $2 million. And it all is going to culminate in July of 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. Once the Declaration of Independence is signed and 
the rebellion is in full force. The Articles Confederation is formed as the first government of the United States. That doesn't work so well. And eventually the Articles of Confederation is replaced with the system we have today with the U.S. Constitution. Now, the United States government that develops with the Articles of Confederation and then eventually the U.S. Constitution, it's completely set up on the ideals of the Enlightenment. So you've got checks and balances. You've got guaranteed rights, the you know, right to bear arms, the right for, of press, the right to freedom of religion, the right to freedom of speech, etc., etc., we have a separation of powers. There are three branches of government. All three are equal. There's representation. There's voting rights for citizens. Um, but you also have to remember that when the US, U.S. Constitution was first put into effect, that those voting rights were not actually for everybody. Like until 1820, voting rights were restricted to only white males with property. And it takes a while to get till... Uh, we are now where anybody over 18 can vote. The French Revolution is happening at almost the same time, and the French Revolution is over a lot of the same ideals. And the origins of the French Revolution can be traced back to uh, King Louis the Fourteenth and King Louis the Fifteenth, but they're outside what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to focus just on King Louis the Sixteenth, and King Louis the Sixteenth was the last absolute monarch of France. Now, as you should know, King Louis the 16th, he's going to help the United States or help the American colonists in the war of revolution. Now, the reason he does that is he wants payback for the loss France experienced in the seven years war. The problem though, is King Louis the 16th, he already had money problems he inherited them from his dad and his grandfather but then on top of that he spent a lot of money he didn't have in the first place so all of this money being spent and all the debts that france had sent the french government into this crippling debt in this crippling financial crisis that couldn't be easily solved because of the absolute monarchy uh, louis the 14th who was the 16th grandfather made a lot of his money from selling titles and offices in exchange for immediate payment. That meant that Louis XIV gave up future tax revenue that Louis XVI really needed, but there's nowhere he could get it from. By 1788, the French government's completely out of money, and Louis XVI and his finance minister, a guy named Jacques Necker, uh, Louis and Jacques Necker, they have to find a way to reform the tax system so that money can come into the bank accounts. Now Jacques Necker, uh, he comes up with a couple of ideas, uh, a single land value tax, convert corvée tax into money tax. And if you don't remember or don't know what corvée is, that's basically working off your tax through labor. Um, Jacques Necker says it doesn't do any good to have labor perform for us when it's really money we need. They wanted to abolish internal tariffs and then they wanted to create provincial assemblies and let, you know, different parts of France have a little bit of control and a little bit of power over their, their, um, their actions. The way to get this done, they thought, was to go to the Assembly of Notables, which was a basically a group of people appointed by the king to advise the king. But the Assembly of Notables hadn't met in like 150 years. So the Assembly of Notables, they like a lot of the ideas, but they felt like they weren't the right people. And the Assembly of Notables tells Louis the Fort, or sorry, Louis the Sixteenth, if you want something done, you have to go to the Estates General. The problem with going to the Estates General is 
they hadn't met since 1614. From 1614 all the way until 1789, France was 100% without a doubt an absolute monarchy. This meant that there were a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainties, and really, honestly, nobody knew what was supposed to happen or how the Estates General worked. What was known and what was remembered is that the Estates General, it met it was made up of three different estates. In, in this case, estates really means classes. The first estate, or the upper class, was made up of 100,000 Catholic clergy. And these 100,000 Catholic clergy, they owned about 10% of the land. And they were completely exempt from taxes. The second estate was made up of about 400,000 nobles. They paid limited numbers of taxes and they owned about 25% of the land. The third estate was everybody else, about 25 million common people. Those 25 million common people, they had the least amount of land, they had the least amount of wealth, they had the least amount of political representation, yet they paid the most taxes. It eventually became clear that the elected representatives of the third estate would not be listened to in the estate's general meeting, and they walked out of the meeting. They went next door to an indoor tennis court, and they gave what's now known as the Tennis Court Oath, and that was on June 20th, 1789. In the Tennis Court Oath, the third estate, they promised not to separate and they promised to meet wherever necessary until the Constitution of France was written. Basically, they're going to meet continuously with or without permission until the king gives the people a constitution and France becomes a constitutional monarchy. And June 20th, 1789 can really be looked at as the day that Louis the 16th absolute reign begins to fall. The revolution is going to begin on July 14, 1789, officially, with the storming of the Bastille in Paris. The storming of the Bastille, it was a prison where political prisoners were kept, but it was also a storehouse for weapons. So, July 14th is considered a holiday in France. It is known today as Bastille Day, and that marks the official beginning of the revolution. Now, you can look at the revolution in three parts, and I apologize I can't go into too much detail on these. It's just a limitation of time. But the first part is constitutional monarchy. It goes from 1789 to 1792. Uh, Louis XVI, he's initially going to work with the National Assembly which is the former third estate. Noble titles are abolished. Church property is nationalized. The Catholic Church begins a, becomes a part of this government. Uh, eventually, though, Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, they're going to attempt to flee France for Russia. They think Russia, uh, not Russia, but Prussia with a P. So Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, they leave France in the middle of the night in July of 1791. They try to make it to the Prussian border. They're caught. Louis XVI is wearing women's clothing and a wig. When they're caught, they are sent back to Paris. And Louis XVI, his wife Maria Antoinette, are placed under arrest. Beginning in 1792, going to 1795, that's the radical republicanism stage. After Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are captured and returned to Paris, the National Assembly is going to declare war on Prussia and Austria for good measure, because that's where a lot of arist aristocratic families have gone. The National Assembly is going to hold new elections, it renames itself the National Convention, and it creates a constitution. A vote is taken on what to do with the king, and it is decided to behead both 
King Louis XVI, and his wife Maria Antoinette. After the king and queen are dead, a group known as the Committee of Public Safety is given control of the government. The Committee of Public Safety is going to pass something known as the Law of Suspects. Uh, basically, if you are not seen as loyal enough or if the government questioned your, your loyalty, you could be arrested. Over 300,000 people are arrested by the Committee of Public Safety. Over 30,000 people are died, are dead, I should say. And this period becomes known as the Reign of Terror. Uh, pretty much all self-government, all individual liberties are set aside until France had defeated all of its enemies. Uh, things get so crazy during the Reign of Terror that the leader of the Committee of Public Safety, Maximilien Robespierre, is assassinated and killed himself uh, by the guillotine. Finally, we come to military consolidation, which is the last three years. Um, it's also known as the Thermidorian Reaction, which was the name of the, the month that it happened in. Little unknown fact, during the French Revolution, the names of the months were changed and the month of July became the month of Thermidor. Well, the Committee on Public Safety is overthrown in July of 1795. Robespierre, the leader of the Committee of Public Safety, is killed by the, the guillotine. A new constitution is created with a bicameral legislation, um, but there's a real lack of stability. And the instability is going to lead the new rulers of France, known as the Directory, to call in the army to help it keep control. And that's where Napoleon comes in, because he was, of course, a member of the French military. On November 9th, 1799, Napoleon is going to overthrow the five-man directory, and Napoleon pulls off a very popular and very successful coup d'etat. He's going to name himself the first consul, which coincidentally is the same title Julius Caesar gave himself. Napoleon, he dissolves the National Assembly. He appoints a Senate on his own that's basically just going to rubber stamp everything he wants. Um, he declares himself emperor in 1804. Napoleon is also going to get rid of any opposition. He censors newspapers. He closes newspapers. And he's going to create a secret police force to help keep him in control. In the middle of all this, he somehow manages to do something good, and he creates the Napoleonic Code. The Napoleonic Code is a new system of laws that outlawed strikes. It allowed people to choose their own occupation. It allowed people equal treatment under the law. It also gave people the right to religious freedom. But no strikes. Women couldn't divorce. And it took away women's political rights as well as legal rights. Now, Napoleon, he's going to attack all of Europe. He's trying to take over Europe. So Napoleon, he's got armies in France, Spain, Italy, Russia, Prussia, Austria, you name it. Napoleon probably has an army there. He's trying to build a empire that would be just as big and just as powerful as that of the British Empire. Unfortunately for Napoleon, Prussia, Austria, Russia, and Great Britain all joined together to defeat the French armies. Napoleon, in 1812, he invades Russia he loses over 500,000 troops. It's a humiliating loss. He turns around and goes home. He tries to 
tries to raise another army. And in October of 1830, at what is now known as the Battle of the Nations, the combined army of Britain, Prussia, Austria, and Russia are going to defeat Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon, he sent to the island of Elba, which was off the coast of France. Unfortunately for the Grand Alliance, as it was called, Napoleon escapes prison. On March 1st, 1815, he goes back to France. He claims he's a changed man, but he raises a military and he goes to fight against the same people who just defeated him. On June 18th of 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon is defeated a second time. This time he's defeated by a guy named the Duke of Wellington. And Napoleon is going to be banished to the island of St. Helena, which was near Brazil. So what happens after Napoleon is gone? Well, this is pretty short here. After Napoleon is gone, the Concert of Europe, as the meeting becomes known as, tries to put Europe back together. Monarchies are restored. All the maps of Europe are redrawn. A system of alliance is created. And the person who does all of this, the person who comes up with the idea of restoring the monarchies, redrawing the maps of Europe, and creating a system of alliances is a guy named Clemens von Metternich. Uh, he'll be in your book. But Clemens von Metternich uh, he is the one heading what's known as the Congress of Vienna. And the Congress of Vienna, they're the ones putting Europe back together. In France, the monarchy is restored. We get a guy named Louis the 18th. Louis the 18th dies in 1824. He's replaced by his brother Charles the 10th. Charles the 10th tries to restore absolute monarchy. Uh, Charles fails to restore absolute monarchy in 1830, and Charles X is replaced by his cousin, a guy named Louis Philippe. But unfortunately for Louis Philippe, he too is overthrown in the year 1848. In Great Britain, liberal forces are going to demand more voting rights. Liberal forces are going to demand uh, better working conditions for workers. Um, some, some of the protests for better working conditions result in the Peterloo Massacre. In 1819, British soldiers are going to fire into a crowd of over 60,000 people who have gathered to demand government reform. And in Bre Britain, in 1832, the Reform Act is passed that gave twice as many males the right to vote. And then finally, 1884, um, all men, regardless of creed or age or social status, are allowed to vote. And Italy, uh, there's a lot of nationalism happening in Italy. And this is going to lead to the unification of formerly independent territories under the leadership of the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia. Uh, led by a guy named Count Cavour, who is the Prime Minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. Um, he's able to provoke Austria into a war. Piedmont, Sardinia wins the war, and they gain territory across northern Italy and become the driving force behind Italian unification. At the same time, a guy named Giuseppe Garibaldi, who's this independent freedom fighter, he takes over the kingdom of the two Sicilies, which was the island of Sicily at the bottom part of Italy and then the bottom part of the actual boot. And when Giuseppe Garibaldi gains control of the kingdom of the two Sicilies, he's going to give the territories to King Victor Emmanuel II, king of the Piedmont Sardinia. So Italian unification, it starts in 1848. It starts very shortly after the, the rule of Napoleon is over. 
and it is completed in the year 1870 when Rome finally becomes part of the Kingdom of Italy. Germany's story is kind of similar. After the defeat of Napoleon, the Holy Roman Empire is broken up into about a dozen or so independent kingdoms, and the most powerful of the former Holy Roman Empire states is going to be the state of Austria and the state of Prussia. Eventually, Austria and Prussia are going to become the leaders of two separate confederations. The Northern Confederation, run by Prussia, is known as the Zollverein. The southern one is um, just going to be led by Austria. It doesn't have a specific name. Um, during the 1850s, Prussia wants to unite Germany under Prussian leadership, but Austria is going to repeatedly stop that from happening until we get to the 1870s when the leader of Prussia, Kaiser Wilhelm I, and his Chief Minister Otto von Bismarck figure out a way to unite Germany. Uh, long story short here, Bismarck, he's going to use an attempt by Denmark to unify two of its provinces to start a war with Austria. This stimulates patriotism and allow Germany to annex the two provinces that Denmark was trying to unite into one. Bismarck's then going to use this crisis over who would inherit the Spanish crown to start a war with France. And the Prussian military defeats France in less than six months. It's completely embarrassing to the French military. And Germany gets the territory known as Alsace-Lorraine. And the German Empire is going to form beginning in 1871. So the country of Italy, the country of Germany, very recent, very new, and it really is part of the aftermath, part of the result of this period of the Enlightenment and revolutions. All right, that's 40 minutes of stuff. That is a whole bunch. I'm sorry that it went so long. Please don't, don't hate me for it. Um, but it's a lot of material. Watch this a time or two throughout the week. And if you have any questions, just send me an email. And I'll be happy to explain it to you more or give you some more information. All right, that's it for today. 38 minutes is enough. Um, we'll talk to you later, and I hope you have a great week. Bye-bye.